Okay. Should we start, Key? Welcome back. So this week, we're going to show you a bit of an update on how the start to our next brine shrimp ecosphere is going to do. Um, what we did last week, in a quick recap, is we went out to a local area and got some natural brackish water to try to start these brine shrimp eggs in there. We had tried brine shrimp ecosphere in the past, and it didn't really fare the best with a more, um, I would call it a sterile approach, where we just used the eggs with tap water and a little bit of plants added to it. But with our freshwater ecospheres, they really tended to do a lot better the more natural stuff we had from the environment. So with this one, we wanted to first see if we can get the brine shrimp to complete a life cycle just in the water that we found locally. And then once we knew that that could happen, we wanted to try to start actually closing that in and making it a closed ecosphere like we really ultimately want to do. So we're going to see how they're doing so far in that natural water. And then we're going to take that information from there and roll with it to try to make a plan for how we can try to make this work despite all the things that we might be working against. One of the things that we didn't show exactly after we set this up and I forgot to mention was that we did have light on this bucket as well. And we're probably gonna wind up moving it out of this bucket because the white color does make it a little bit harder to get light in there. But brine shrimp do actually orientate themselves towards whatever light source they might have. So in nature, obviously the light's gonna come from above from the sun. So they actually tend to swim upside down with their belly exposed to the light. And they've actually found that if you put them under like a lighted table for like a microscope observation or anything like that, they will then actually swim right side, well, what we call right side up at least, with their bellies down towards the light. So we're also putting a light source on top of here while it's been bubbling. And that's one for them to kind of know where, which way is up for them. And also so that any algae or any plants matter that might be in here to give them also a light source to actually photosynthesize as well. We didn't set it directly on top. Do be careful about that though, because if you set, especially if you have like regular incandescent or even compact fluorescent and LED lights, if they're directly touching the container, it's gonna impart a lot of heat to it. So I definitely suggest that if you have a light source to make sure that there's a fair gap for air to flow both in and around it. Most lights should have exit vents for the hot air to leave, but make sure that the light isn't touching the container because it's probably gonna put too much heat into whatever it is. Even this one, despite having a few openings. The downside also to this bucket is it, it is pretty hard to see anything going on with a camera especially because the brine shrimp are so small and so lightly colored that once I put light in here, they almost blend in or just vanish with the, the white in the background from the bucket. I can see them over the dirt a little bit, so it makes it a little hard to see. What I'm gonna to try to do to get a better look at them is use this glass right here. So I'm gonna take some water out, look in through here to see what we can see going on, what's moving around, and then we are going to wind up moving everything from here into this tank. Brine shrimp, along with swimming like with their body oriented towards the light in a certain way, are also attracted towards the light because a lot of the stuff they feed off of is also inherently in more light areas. So I'm gonna turn this on for a minute or two to try to get as many brine shrimp into one area as possible. And then I'm gonna take our little sample out of there and we're gonna take a look inside. I've given it a bit to, for the light to kind of attract them. And one of the neat things I was watching to see if I saw other stuff moving. And while hydras really don't move very much, I'm pretty sure I see something, it's either hydra or something very similar. And it's kind of neat to see it here because I just didn't really know what to expect when we gathered from this park and what we would see. So I think that's really cool to see that. I didn't see anything else big moving around, but we'll see if time will tell if there's more stuff in here than I actually realized. There we go. Nice glass of brine shrimp. Gathering right in front of the light, I definitely see a bunch of the baby brine shrimp, but the hard part's not hatching brine shrimp. The hard part is keeping them alive. Um, to an extent, kind of like regular eggs, they have an amount of nutrients that they carry with them through the hatching cycle. So as an adolescent, there's, there's only so much demand that they have for food up until they get to a certain point. And that's when they start needing to find the natural food around them. So we have to see if we can break into that adult period of this light cycle and then keep this entire thing going until we start getting some more babies. So we're gonna wind up moving them over into the other container, adding some food in and hoping for the best really over the next about week or so. Cause as long as they have enough nutrients and resources, about one week they should reach maturity to the point where we can tell that it was the environment that kept them alive and not just hatching. After actually taking the macro lens and looking at what was in the glass when I took the little sample of it, 
it seems that what I thought was a bunch of brine shrimp actually turned out to be, at least the majority of it turned out to be copepods. And there was some brine shrimp still in there, some baby brine shrimp, but the vast majority of stuff that was actually in the water was, in fact, the copepods. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, not quite as encouraging because I didn't see the uh, amount of population of brine shrimp that I originally had thought. So I might actually wind up taking a little sample of the water into a local fish store and really taking a deep look into exactly what kind of water parameters are in there. Because I know brine shrimp prefer a more base pH to hatch in as well as salt water. So we should have the salt water pretty much handled. I, I can see the deposits from what dried up on here from what I'm pretty sure is salt. <laughs> All right, so now that I've made this completely unable to be seen into, I'm going to put in a not really measured amount of spirulina in there. Again, I'm not trying to really put a ton in here, especially since I can't really see exactly how much I'm putting in right now, but I am going to put some spirulina in here. Some people even say that it's possible that the spirulina could start growing if you give it the right conditions. I don't know how true that is necessarily, depending on, like, I guess it probably depends on the processing and just the companies it comes from, but ideally that would be awesome. Once I add the air bubbler back onto this, that should help start mixing that spirulina into the water and make it more accessible to everything that's swimming around inside of it. And I'll probably check back, and if I don't, if I see the water clear up a lot in probably the next day or two, I might add a little bit more spirulina here and there. But what, what I really want to see now is, like I mentioned before, getting the brine shrimp to hatch isn't nearly as hard as getting them to get to adults. And since there's a lot lower numbers than I had expected, we might have to see how they really fare once we're adding food on purpose. Also, <laughs> for the bubbling, a simpler method that a number of you have pointed out to try, that I'm going to give it a shot here, I've never used it before, is tying knots into the airline. The one thing I'm a little apprehensive about with that is putting back pressure onto the pump, but I guess the further you put the pump down into the water, it's going to get that back pressure from the water, pressure, the water anyway. So we'll see how that works out in comparison to my whole other method of putting a bunch of holes in it. It seems to have limited a bit, but I still want to reduce it a bit more. So I actually have a little dimmer switch attached to it. And I can, at least with this pump, I can turn down the intensity of the bubbles a bit. That's more like what I want. Now, I'm going to try with a little airstone. And normally, especially for something this small, I would not suggest it just because there's going to be so much current coming through. But because I have this plugged into a dimmer switch, I'm going to, I, I can drop the pressure down a little bit. I will say though, especially if you're dropping the pressure on purpose, make sure you keep your air pump above the tank. That way, in case something happens and there's not enough pressure to push the air out anymore, it doesn't wind up siphoning back into the air pump. It's always a best practice to keep the air pump above whatever you're pumping air into. If you want to see how much the entire like full power would be, That'd be like this, which is quite vigorous for such a small container like this. Now that we have them in this container, it's going to be a lot easier to actually see their progress as we watch to see if they make it to adulthood and then actually reproduce after that. So this project is going to be a little bit of a longer term project. We're going to keep kind of changing and tweaking little things here and there. We want to use as much natural stuff as we can. So we need to keep seeing what works best, what areas we're going to work best for this. So. 
it's not going to be a series where it's one after the other, but we will start having more and more updates on it here and there. So the next video might not necessarily be just about this, but this is going to be an ongoing process as we see them progress and getting older and start getting closer to closer to the point where we think we can actually seal up a project that's similar to this. You're so sweet. On this episode, kitty ecospheres. No. No. I was gonna talk about this thing, kitty, but I can't. That container's for ecospheres, not kitties. <laughs> she would fit in there pretty easily, though. Wouldn't have a one fit there gap, though. Mm. And she's a predator. <laughs> Not nearly enough food in there for a predator. No. Way too small.